So this morning, I'm going to try and read through um, chapter 5 of the first 600 years for our history class. So I'm going to start out with a prayer. Christ my Lord, the giver of light and wisdom, who opened the eyes of the blind man and transformed the fishermen into wise heralds and teachers of the gospel through the coming of the Holy Spirit. Shine also in my mind the light of the grace of the Holy Spirit. Grant me discernment, understanding, and wisdom and learning. Enable me to complete my assignments and to abound in every good work. For to you I give honor and glory. Amen. Chapter 5. The Origins of Gnosticism. The years from 70 to 140, as well as being a period of expansion, were also a period of internal crisis for Judeo-Christianity. It was at this moment that there appeared in various forms a dualist current known as Gnosticism. This was something quite new, arising from a particular historical situation, and must be distinguished from Gnosis, which was, in a wider sense, the Jewish and Judeo-Christian apocalyptic occur uh, current. Gnosticism was one of the forms in which it, it developed, nor must it be identified with the dualist tendencies of certain Jewish movements, like that of Qumran, which may, and which may betray Iranian influence. If it borrowed from these currents, it made them something radically new, Gnosticism in the strict sense. The milieu where it appeared was that of the marginal zones of Judaism and Judeo-Christianity. The existence of these zones has already been mentioned. Before the year 70, they appeared as aberrations of the mess messianic movement and apocalyptic hopes, but we do not seem to find Gnosticism in the strict sense there. R. M. Grant has shown that Simon the Samaritan, held by he um, heresiologists, were, uh, to be the father of Gnosis was not a Gnostic, but that his disciples became Gnostics after 70. Asiatic millenarianism was already active at the time when Paul wrote to Timothy, but it did not become a Gnostic heresy until the end of the first century, according to Serinthus. H.J. Shops, Shops is doubtless correct in considering Ebionism as a very archaic Judeo-Christian heterodoxy, in which Christ was the prophet announced by Moses, but not the Son of God. But O. Coleman is also right in noting that, according to Epiphanius, it was after the year 70 that this group represented a heterodoxy. Apparently, it is in this sense that we must interpret a passage in Hegesippus, on the origins of heresies. Hegesippus writes that it was under the Episcopy of Simon, after the death of James, that Thebetus introduced heresies, starting with the seven Jewish sects. He came as the originators of these heresies. He names as the originators of this her these heresies Simon, Cleobius, Cleobius uh, Dositheus, Gorthio, Gortheos, and the Maspothians, and adds, From these came the Mendad, Mendandrians, the Marcionites, the, Car, the Carpocratians, the Valentinians, the Basilicians, and the, Saturn, and the Saturnalians. It is clear that this passage cannot be taken literally, but two ideas emerge from it. The first is the distinction of the three stages in the movement that leads to Gnosticism. The original milieu was heterodox Judaism, and it was there that the heterodox Christianity of Simon and the Nazareans developed. Finally, this heterodox Christianity gave birth to Gnosticism in the strict sense. Hegesippus is right in, in dating the appearance of Gnosticism to the Episcopacy Episcopacy of Simon, that is to say, after the fall of Jerusalem, but he was is mistaken in dating Simon and the Mespothians at to this period, for they belong to the third wave. Ebionism. First, we must note the existence after the year seventy of two heterodox Judeo-Christian movements, which were not strictly Gnostic. In his dialogue 
a little after 150, Justin distinguishes two categories of Judeo-Christians, those who share in the common faith but remain faithful to Jewish practices, and who are descendants of the community of James, and others who recognize Jesus Christ, Jesus as Christ while maintaining that he was a man among men. Justin does not apply the name Ebionite to this group, but Irenaeus, Origen, and Eusebius all consider this assertion that Christ is a man like any other, born of Joseph and Mary, to be the distinctive characteristic of Ebionism. This acceptance of Jesus as the prophet announced by Moses, but not as the Son of God, was common to many heterodox Judeo-Christian groups, and it is very notable. It is very probable that it existed well before the year seventy. That much may be granted to H. J. Shops, but it is possible to determine with greater precision the coordinates of the Ebionites in the strict sense. Epiphanius says that they originated after the capture of Jerusalem among the Judeo-Christian refugees in Pela. In this region, he had their gospel in his hands, and he preserved extracts from it. This gospel represents a transformation of the gospel of the Nazareans in a heterodox sense, and was written at the beginning of the second century under Trajan. Their baptismal customs also suggest a link with Transjordan, Epiphanius includes among their holy books the Itinerary of Peter, this work, which forms the basis of the homilies and the Clementine recognitions, itself rests on the Kyrigmas Kyrg uh, of Peter, which belong to the first half of the second century. Now these latter writings show remarkable resemblances with the doctrine of the Essenes, particularly the true prophet, the two spirits, the rejection of bloody sacrifices. So it is on good, good grounds that Coleman suggests that the Ebionites were a group of Essenes converted to Christ after the year 70 in Transjordan, either refugees from Qumran or belonging to the emigrants from Kokba near Damascus. They were probably Aramaic-speaking Christians, very attached to Jewish practices, but hostile to the Temple of Jerusalem and holding esoteric doctrines like the Transmigration and like the transmigration of souls. Here we have a normal development of the Qumran group. The Ebionites shared the Essenes' conception of the opposition of the two principles, but Irenaeus expressly points out that they did not teach that the world was created by any other power but God. So they were not Gnostics in the strict sense of the word. Elkesaism Two. Another sect appeared in the region of Trajan. Its founder, Elkese, received a revelation through a book given him by an angel. The book proclaimed the remission of sins committed after baptism. Elkese received his revelation in the country of the Parthians in the, in the third year of Trajan's reign, that is the year 100. Parthian rule then, Parthian rule then extended over eastern Syria, and Trajan was at war with the Parthians. The form of the revelation calls the Song of the Pearl, recalls the Song of the Pearl, preserved in the Acts of Thomas, which belongs to the same period and shows some features of the Parthian mythology. The Jewish characteristics are also striking. Elkese El repeats that the faithful are obliged to be circumcised and to live according to the law. And Elkeseites prayed facing Jerusalem. Elkese came from Jerusalem, thought like a Jew, and knew the teaching of Christ. But in many respects, his Christianity recalls Ebionism. For him, Christ is a prophet. The epistles of Paul are rejected. So Elkeseites, Elkeseites were heterodox Judeo Christians, but they belonged also to heterodox Judaism. They rejected sacrifices and retained only certain parts of the Old Testament. They also had Baptist practices. Peterson has shown that these were designated to drive out concupiscence, the bad yezer, considered as a devil. Finally, we may note the resemblance with Hermas, who also received a revelation by means of a book containing the announcement of a final remission of sins committed after baptism. Now, Hermas was a Judeo-Christian prophet, 
So we may conclude that Ecclesiasm was a heterodox Judeo-Christian movement, also, or close, or rather, a heterodox Judeo-Christian movement close to Ebionism, but belonging to East Syria. Three, the, no, the Nicolaitans. These works, those works of the New Testament, which are later in the than the year seventy, describe a movement which everywhere re presents an analogous features. The Epistle of Jude emanates from the Judeo Christians who came back to Jerusalem after seventy. The author is full of Jewish apocalyptic ideas. He he denounces men who sully their flesh scorn the hev heavenly powers, and revile authority. They murmur and complain of their fate. They are scoffers, animal natures, what without the life of the Spirit. The same expressions appear in Second Peter. The false teachers scorn the heavenly powers and abandon themselves to defiling appetites. They scorn authority, follow the path of Balaam, and are mocking deceivers. They promise freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. Sounds like our modern world. The Apocalypse of John describes a group with similar tendencies in Asia Minor. At Pergamum and uh, Thyatira, Thyatira, he points, re reproaches them for admitting followers from the school of Balaam, who eat what is sacrificed to idols and fall into fornication and claim to know the deep mysteries of Satan. If we collect fe the features common to these passages, we note, first of all, a complete rejection of Noachic principles, which must have scandalized the Judeo-Christians. But there is more than that. Sovereign rule and authority are reviled, which certainly seems to be mean a condemnation of the God of creation and of the Old Testament. This doctrine is linked with Balaam, who... For contemporary Judaism is the ancestor of the Magi and the father of dualism. Here we have the basic features of the Gnostic revolt against the Old Testament God, considered as having fa failed to realize apocalyptic expectations. This doctrine professes a complete freedom, which is a deceptive imitation of the spiritual freedom of the Pauline churches. The Apocalypse makes a distinction between the, this first group and that of the Nicolaitans. Ephesus is congratulated on hating them. On the other hand, at Pergamum, there are some who belong to them, and Irenaeus says that their teacher was a proselyte from Antioch, whom the Acts mention amongst the seven deacons. This link appears suspicious to Eusebius. It may have resulted from the interpretation of an anecdote told by Clement of Alexandria, according to which the deacon Nicholas offered his wife to other men. So our information about the Nicolaitans amounts to very little. Nicholas was a Greek equivalent of Balaam. This fact, when added to the link in the Apocalypse between Nicolaitans and the earlier sect, suggests one and the same condemnation of the Old Testament God and of moral libertinism. Yeah, that one has a lot in common with uh, our world today. Um, freedom, freedom through enslavement to the passions as a method for forgetting oneself and thus forgetting oneself in things that uh, make you feel good in a fleeting way, i.e. the passions, um, is associated with um, a kind of salvation. Four, Cerinthus or Corinthus. These first Gnostic movements appeared in Judeo-Christian circles in Palestine and Asia Minor under Domitian. A second group was that of Cerinthus, who, so Irenaeus tells us, is it was a contemporary of John, and a Judeo-Christian who clung to circumcision and the Sabbath. After the resurrection, he awaited Christ's earthly kingdom very material in character, and the restoration of worship at Jerusalem. He taught that the world had not been created by God, but by a remotely distant power having no knowledge of God, who was above everything. Jesus was born of Joseph and Mary and was merely an outstanding man. 
Christ descended on him under the form of a dove at his baptism to announce the unknown Father. He ascended to the Father before the Passion. If we analyze these beliefs, we find two major points. One, on the one hand, Serenthus developed a heterodox Judeo-Christian attitude, professing a very material kind of messianism. This millenarianism was held in common with many Christians of Asia, but it denied the virgin birth of Jesus and his divine nature. Jesus was a great prophet on whom a divine power descended. We are here dealing with heterodox Judeo-Christianity, such as we find in Ebionism. Epiphanius also links Serenthus with the Ebionites. Finally, Serenthus considered that the world was not created by God, but by a demiurge who knew nothing of the true God. There we have Gnosticism in the strict sense, for the first time precisely formulated. It was in this respect, characteristic of the period of the Trajan's, of Trajan's rule, that the Serenthus modified an earlier Judeo-Christian current found in Jewish as well as in Christian heterodoxy. 5. The Simonians Hegesibus is surely mistaken in the making of Simon a, di a disciple of Thebutus um, after 70. But what does seem true, as R.M. Grant has pointed out, is that the movement stemming from Simon, who had first, who had at first been a Samaritan messianist, acquired new characteristics after the year 70. It is possible to link this development either with Menden, Menender, who, discuss, who is discussed later, or with Cloebius, whom Hegesippus names as one of the heretics of Thebutus after 70, and who appears associated with Simon in several passages. Here can be seen a development similar to that of Asiatic Messianism, which, with Serenthus, acquired more pronounced features after the year 70. The first author to provide us with information on these developments of the Simonian movement is Justin, and as he himself was a native of Samaria, his evidence is trustworthy. Irenaeus devotes a long notice to Simon. Justin says that, the, that nearly all the Samaritans adore Simon as the first god and unite with him a certain Helen, who is his first thought. Enoia. Here we find a considerable development compared with what the Acts told us about Simon. Grant has pointed out that Simon appears as the first god in opposition to the angels who have created the world and inspired the Old Testament. As Irenaeus says, states later on, the first god came to free man from the angels who were ruling creation badly. Here we come face to face with Gnosticism, with a condemnation of the Old Testament god and of the creation which is his work. With good reason, the fathers of the church considered Simonian teaching as the beginning of this movement, but the Gnostic dualism does not go back to Simon himself. It represents, uh, it represents a development of his doctrine after the year 70, and it is at this moment that Gnosticism appears simultaneously in Asia and in Syria. The association of the woman Helen with Simon may be connected with the cult of Helen in Samaria, or simply a concern for Hellenization, as Grant thinks. In any case, here at the beginning, we meet an aspect of that syncretism which was to characterize Gnosticism. Justin also records the existence at the period when he was writing, about 145, of a Simonian community in Rome, doubtless among the Samaritans. He dates the foundation of this community to a visit Simon paid to Rome under Claudius, before 54, at the same time as Peter. The pseudo-Clementine writings, for their part, tell of controversies in Rome between Peter and Simon. Here we must see the legendary expression of the spread of Gnosticism during this period and of its conflicts with the Christian communities. Finally, Justin records the presence of an altar consecrated to Simon in the island of uh, Tiber. In fact, it was an altar consecrated to a saving fertility god, Simo Sancus, and was rediscovered in 1574.
but it is possible that Simon's disciples thought it belonged to the worship of their own founder and God. Menander Hegesippus mentions the men, uh, Menandrians in the second wave of sects stemming from Jewish heterodoxy. Justin tells us that Menander was a Samaritan, like Simon, and a disciple of Simon, and adds that he came to Antioch. So it was through him that Gnosticism spread in western Syria, which was to become one of its chief centers. Justin first of all tells us that he practiced magic, a feature common to the Samaritan Gnostics. Gnosticism was not only a theology, but also a theurgy. Eusebius notes that these magical practices helped to discredit the Christians in pagan circles, and in fact we find Lucian and Celsus on, in the second century saying that Christ himself was a magician. According to Justin, Menander taught that those who followed him would not die. Here we probably have an allusion to the Messianic hopes. Paul put the Thessalonians on guard against any spiritual utterance, any message or letter purporting to come from us, which suggests that the day of the Lord is close at hand. In Ephesus, Hymenaeus and Philetus taught that the resurrection had already taken place. In Menander, there was certainly a continuation of the messianism of Simon and Serenthus. Irenaeus tells us that, the, that Menander claimed to be the savior sent from on high, from the world of the invisible aeons, in order to save men. By virtue of his baptism, a man became higher than the angels of creation. These doctrines are very close to those which Irenaeus attributes to Simon. It may be that it was Menander who gave Simon's Samaritan messianism its Gnostic theology. Saturninus Menander was the hinge, as it were, between Simon's Samaritan messianism and Gnosticism. He exercised his apostolate in, apostolate in Antioch between 70 and 100. His successor was, as Justin tells us, Saturn, Saturn, Saturninus, who was, uh, was the first great figure in Gnosticism, active in Antioch between 100 and about 130. Ignatius, whose doctrine was a development of Menander's, was bishop during the first part of his career. He set the seven creator angels, the leader of whom is the God of the Jews, in opposition to the hidden God. These angels created man, but man crawled on the earth until the hidden God had given him a share in, he, in the light he emits. Saturninus, Saturninus condemned marriage, which he said came from Satan. Some of his disciples abstained from meat. Irenaeus notes that he was the first to have distinguished two races of men, those who share in the heavenly light and those who do not. It is this doctrine which goes to make up Gnostic dualism. What stems from the creation of the planetary angels is set radically apart from God. But we may also note that the framework of his thought remains largely Jewish. It depends on the account of creation in Genesis, one of the themes about which Jews at the time were speculating. His, ascent, his asceticism belongs to marginal Judaism. This doctrine of the seven archangels is that of the Jewish apocalypse. But at the same time, he makes Yahweh, the prince of the angels, responsible for creation. So here there is a crisis within Judeo-Christianity, a rebellion against the God of Israel. 8. The Barbalo Gnostics in, the, in chapter 19 of book 1 of his Adversus Heresis, I, um, Irenaeus sums up the doctrine of a sect whom he calls the Barbello Gnostics. We, know, we now possess the book, the first part of which he sums up. It is the Apocryphon of John, one copy of which is in Berlin, and three copies of which have been found at Nag Hammadi. The large number of copies shows that it was an important work. It takes the form of a revelation made by the risen Christ to St. John on the Mount of Olives. The first part contains a genealogy of the aeons of the uh, Pleroma. Then, from 45 onwards, there is a kind of commentary on Genesis. The seven archons wish to make a man like God, a man incapable of moving. 
Wisdom, Sophia, gives him a power that makes him greater than the Archons and arouses their jealousy, particularly of their leader, um, Ialdabaoth, Ialdabaoth, the Jewish Yahweh. The work is full of allusions to the a Jewish Apocrypha, and we are still in the same climate of thought. Its doctrine also resembles that developed by the Epistle of in the epistle of Eunostus, found at Nagabadi. So it would seem to be the work of a disciple of Saturnina, Saturninus rather than of Saturninus himself. Its Syrian origin seems clear. Here, at least, we have an original document of primitive Gnosticism, and H.C. Puch dates it to the first half of the second century. All the Gnostic themes are already present, including the aeons of the Pleroma and the role of Sophia. At the same time, the unity of the Gnostic doctrine appears through, through its many different manifestations and currents. The Sethians. In chapter 30 of Book 1, Irenaeus follows up his account of the doctrine of the Bar Barbelo Gnostics with that of the Sethians. A comparison of this account with the second part of the Apocryphon of John, which Irenaeus had not summed up in the previous chapter, shows that here there is a development of the same gnosis with a more pronounced Judeo-Christian character. After the Father, the aeons of the Pleroma are the Son and the Holy Spirit, then Christ and the Church. The aeons of the Pleroma produce Sophia, who, from her union with the lower waters, gives birth to seven sons. Um, Aldabaut, Io, Sebaoth, Adonai, Elohim, Astaphane, and Horeos. These angels make man in their image. Christ descends through the seven heavens to the stupefaction of the powers, taking shape, the shape of the angels of each heaven. Here we have the same basic themes as in the Apocryphon. And it is noticeable that the seven angels have different names of Yahweh in the Old Testament. Once more, the themes of Judeo-Christian theology are evident, as found in the Ascension of Isaiah and the Epistle of the Apostles and the Shepherd of Hermas. The pre-existence of Christ and the Church, the hidden descent of Christ through the spheres of angels, the amazement, amazement of the powers, here is the most pronounced form of Judeo-Christian Gnosticism which is contemporary with Judeo-Christian theology. Its link with Antioch seems uncertain. It is in this group that we must place several of the works of Nag Hammadi as the book of the great Seth. Carpocrates. From Asia and Syria, Judeo-Christian Gnosticism spread to Egypt, where it made extraordinary progress. It is known that Serenthus came to Alexandria, about 120, we find there a doctrine which appears to be a development of his, that of Carpocrates, who also taught that the world had been created by angels, that Jesus was Joseph's son, and that a power came down upon him. Whoever partakes of this power is his equal, and is able to scorn the archons who made the world and to accomplish the same miracles as Jesus. This feature was absent from Serenthus but it may belong to Asiatic Gnosticism in its extreme form. Carpocrates, in effect, shows no sign of Zerinthus's messianic millenarianism. The latter was confined to Asia and the Western world. On the other hand, we do find in him the notion that man can be freed from the archons only after having been the slave of the vices over which they preside. Otherwise, he has to be reincarnated in order to pay his debt. The doctrine of the devils, of the vices, and that of the reincarnation come from heterodox Judaism. To them, Carpocrates adds an amoralism which seems to stem from Gnostic rebellion, not only against the Jewish God, but against the law. In this respect, and in his scorn for the angels, he recalls the Nicolaitans, and appears as an expression of pure Gnosticism in its violent rejection of creation. Basilides. Basilides, too, was an Alexandrian and a contemporary of 
Carpocrates, but Epiphanius says that he was a disciple of Menander. It is clear that his Gnosticism was in the main line of Syrian Gnosticism, but he was the first to organize and make a great synthesis of Simonian doctrines. The Progress of the Gospel, Plate 3, The Sicilian Gates Through the Taurus Mountains, Below the Via Appia leading into Rome. In order to take the gospel into Asia, Paul and his companions must have passed several times through this cleft in the Taurus Mountains. References to dangers from robbers may well refer to the dangers encountered on journeys through this region. The Via Appia also must have seen many early Christian preachers and travelers for Paul's entry into Rome as a prisoner. See Acts 28, 3 through 15. Plate 4. Gospel of Thomas, Codex from Nagamadi. The Gospel of Thomas is one of 49 documents found by some Egyptian farmers in a ruined tomb near the village of Nagabadi. The documents are contained in 13 books, all in codex form. This sarcophagus shows several of the main themes of early Christian art and catechesis. Pagan models were often used, and here the picture of Jonah recalls the sleeping figure of Endym Endymion, who was often depicted on pagan sarcophagi. It is suggested that the sarcophagus depicts the stages of initiation, Jonah disgorged by the monster, faith, an or ornate preacher, a philosopher, catechesis, an orante, prayer, oh my gosh, a philosopher, catechesis, the shepherd, salvation, and finally baptism. The font of the baptistry of the house church at Dura Europos, Syria, built circa 230. Um, you can see the... The font stands at the west end of the baptistry. Over it is a brilliantly painted um, edicula on the inside or ceiling of which there are paintings of stars. On the back wall, the figure of the good shepherd standing near his flock occupies the higher and larger portion of the painting, while below are Adam and Eve, the tree and the serpent. It is difficult to understand the significance of the stars, but it may well represent the kingdom of heaven in which the faithful will shine as stars. The figure of the Good Shepherd and the portrayal of Adam and Eve draw together ideas of sin and redemption, the church and its master, particularly relevant to the candidate for baptism. Wow. Huh. It's hard to see. Cool. In him, who is the him? I lost my place, so I'm going to come back. Oh. But Basilides was the first to organize and make a great synthesis of Simonian doctrines. In him, we once again find the origin of angels creating the world and sharing its dominion. One of them is the god of the Jews who tries to make the others submit to his power. Basilides attached no importance to the fact of eating food sacrificed to the idols. John reproached the Nicolaitans with this in the Apocalypse. This total freedom from the law was a feature of Gnosticism. It represented an exaggerated an exaggeration of teaching at the opposite extreme from Johannine Judeo-Christianity. The interest of the Basilides was, is that of the Gnostic transposition of Jewish apocalyptic ideas 
is is that the Gnostic transposition of Jewish apocalyptic ideas appears in him bef more than in any other teacher. R. M. Grant has noted how speculations about the sacred calendar, which were a, one of the expressions of the theology of history among the Jewish apocalyptic writers, were transposed into a cosmological plane and provided a framework for the doctrine of the aeons. Thus, for Basilides, there are 365 heavens, to each of which corresponds an angelic order. Basilides, there, moreover, called himself an intermediary between Jews and Christians. It was also from Judaism that Basilides borrowed his doctrine of the vices as personal devils dwelling in the soul. This also has been found in Carpocrates. The resemblance between these different mo movements can leave no doubt about their fundamental continuity. The basic element was the opposition between the hidden God who became manifest in Christ and the angels who create the world to whom Yahweh belongs. The latter idea may have been based on the role which Jewish tr tradition, according to the angels, accorded to the angels in the creation of man and in the gift of the law. But after the year 70, a certain number of Jews and Judeo-Christians adopted it as the expression of their revolt against the God who had disappointed them in their eschatological hopes and against the creation which was his work. The Jewish and Judeo-Christian origin of the movement clearly appears from the fact that all these movements, speculations about Genesis, the doctrine of the seven angels and sacred calendar, the angels of the vices and the descent through the spheres, derive from apocalypse apocalyptic thought. The main historical course of the movement also appears. It was born simultaneously after the year 70 in the Messianist Judeo-Christian groups in Asia with Serinthus and in Antioch with Menander. The Asiatic current was more practical and chiefly emphasized rebellion against the law. It appeared as the ex exacerbation of certain Pauline tendencies and was, in certain respects, amoral. The Antiochian current, in other, on the other hand, was more speculative. With the Apocryphon of John, it produced the first great Gnostic work shown, known to us. The two currents developed in Alexandria at the end of the period we are studying. But while the former was extinguished with the final blaze of Jewish Messianism, the latter was to find in Alexandria conditions that favored remarkable growth. And add, that ends the reading of chapter 5 um, on Gnosticism and related heresies. I'm just going to now make sure that this is recording. Okay, it's recording. Alexandria. That's good. How long is this chapter? Okay, so A. So this is 10 pages, this next chapter. So it's going to take me around 30 minutes to read. And I have exactly that amount of time. So we're going to go ahead and read that. <sighs> chapter 6. Ugh.
Chapter 6, The Judeo-Christian Customs and Images Despite the varying forms they took, the Christian communities possessed certain features in common during the period from 70 to 140. These features were a kind of bridge between the original Christianity and its expression in a Judeo and a Greco-Roman context. In fact, they were still deeply tinged with Judaism. We can reconstruct them in some excellent form and in some extent from certain books of the New Testament which reflect life in a Christian community from Judeo-Christian literature, the chief works of which we have <laughs> already mentioned, and from archaeological remains, but these are still rare. Here we shall note the main facts. Certain heterodox books like the pseudo-Clementine works, Mandean tracts, and certain Gnostic works also provide us with information. Christian 1. Christian Initiation About preparation for baptism there exists little information. A comparison with what we find in Jewish communities at the same time, notably at Qumran and later forms of Christian initiation, suggests that this preparation was formulated at the, a very early date. Justin gives us a glimpse of it at, in his first apology. He explains that those who are convinced and believe the truths that have been announced and who promise to live in this way are taught to pray and, while fasting, to implore God to give, forgive their sins. So there were two stages. During the first, the person, the person who wished to be converted received instruction and was taught how to lead a Christian life. Then, when he knew the facts and had shown himself capable of leading a Christian life, he was admitted to a period of immediate preparation, liturgical in character. The details of these two stages emerge from documents of the period, especially the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas. The dogmatic catechesis varied for pagans and Jews. The former had to be taught about God, the Creator, and the Resurrection. There is an echo of this instruction in Justin's Apologies. All had to be taught about Christ. We have this catechesis summed up in the old formulas found in St. Paul and other early, other writers, early writers of the Church. These are the earliest forms of the Creed. Our Apostles' Creed is the development of the Roman Creed of the 2nd century, and so it is the echo of the oral tradition of faith, parallel to the written of Gospels. Instruction did not consist only in expounding the mysteries of Christ. It showed in them the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies, which was the aim of the Epistle of Barnabas. The same method is to be found a little later in the demonstration of the apostolic preaching by St. Irenaeus, who uses early mater earlier material. The passages quoted in these documents were practically the same, and most of them are found in the New Testament, so it seems certain that the catechists already had at their disposal collections like that which we find in the 3rd century in the writings of, the Cyp of Cyprian, under the name Testimonia. This is all the more probable, since collections of this type already seem to have been in use among the Jews. There is another proof of the existence of these collections of Testimonia. They are found in various authors, with a certain number of characteristic modifications due to their adaptation to catechesis. In particular, it happens that we find combined quotations where several passages of the Old Testament are lumped together in a single quotation which was already true in Judaism, for Deuteronomy 6, 5, and Levitic, Leviticus 9, 18. For example, the first epistle of Peter combines the three passages on the stone. Sometimes the quotations are intentionally modified. A word is changed or added. The most typical example is the addition of the words um, aposulo and episulo to Psalm 95, 10, and Deuteronomy 28, 66, which are also treated as references to the cross. Next, we have a moral catechesis, remarkable examples of which are found in the Didache and the Epistle of Bar Barnabas. The elements of this catechesis are the two commandments, to love God and our neighbor, the golden rule, an explanation of the two ways, and finally, the certain, and finally certain regulations bearing particularly on the laws formulated in, by the Council of Jerusalem. All these come from Judaism. The catechesis of the two ways shows indisputable points of resemblance with the rule of the community. 
of Qumran. The words of Christ quoted in our catechesis are closely are close to the New Testament, but with notable variants. So it would seem that we have here an oral tradition dependent of the gospel, independent of the Gospels, preserved in catechetical instruction. The doctrine of the two ways of reappears in other works of this time, like the Shepherd of Hermas and the Testaments. There is finally a tradition of Sunday prayer. A second group comprises the baptismal rites. Baptism is preceded by a fast undertaken by the catechumen and other persons. This fast seems to have the same results as exorcism. It is preceded by a by a reunication apotaxis of Satan. Renunciation. Oh my gosh. By a renunciation, apotaxis of Satan, and an adherence to Christ, syntaxis. This action seems to be the culmination of the catechesis on, on the two ways, and it is found at the end of the catechesis in Qumran. It would seem that Pliny's letter to Trajan alludes to it, when it speaks of swearing to renounce certain crimes. Finally, besides the fast, there was also, doubtless, a laying on of hands. This is mentioned by Clement of Alexandria. Baptism itself, as a rite, is linked distantly with baptism in the Jordan, and immediately with John's baptism and, eschatological, and its eschatological significance. Immediately it was linked to Christ's baptism in the Jordan. It does not seem to have been connected with the Jewish baptism of the proselytes, for nothing justified such baptism in the case of converted Jews. Baptism took place by immersion, as is shown by the Didache, and the shepherd, and usually in spring water. There was a triple immersion, corresponding to the invocation of the three persons, which brought about the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This last point was stressed by many allusions to the running water, which was connected with it. Running water means water that gives life. Its symbolism seems to depend on Ezekiel 47, 1 through 3, to which there are references in John 7, 18. Um, a probably, probably that is also the origin of baptismal symbol of the fish, which we find perhaps on a Judeo-Christian ossuary of the Dominus Flevit. We also find in Hermas the comparison of baptismal immersion with the descent into hell, which presupposes the symbolism of the waters of death. Baptism seems to have been accompanied by several subsidiary rites. There was, a, there was first an anointing with consecrated oil, which practice is attested by Theophilus of Antioch. The Coptic text of the Didache gives, after the Eucharist, a prayer for consecrating the oil, which seems to be authentic. The resemblance with the Valentinian liturgy suggests that this oil also served for extreme unction. In the Valentinian liturgy, the anointing which follows baptism is the sign of the gift of the Spirit. This notion, which reappears later in Tertullian, must be a vestige of the Judeo-Christian thinking for whom baptism by water was John's baptism and brought only the remission of sins. Some Judeo-Christian groups seem to have been aware only of this baptism of repentance. This is true of the Ebionites and the El um, Elchisites, they were probably able to administer it more than once. We find the same notion held by Apollo before he met Aquila and Priscilla, and perhaps by the Samaritans mentioned in Acts 18.16. In the apostolic tradition, anointing in conjunction with baptism make a single sacrament in imitation of Christ's baptism and anointing in the Jordan. With the anointing was closely linked the signing of with the sign of the cross, the sphragus, the sign could have many uses, but it was primarily linked with the baptismal anointing. The rite is also important that in her is so important that in Hermas it actually means baptism by itself. It seems clear that the sign originally means the Hebrew Tav, the symbol of the name of God, looking back to Ezekiel 9 4, states that the elect have the mark on their brow. The Damascus document seems to ha assume that the Essenes were marked with this sign. The Judeo-Christian inscriptions of Palestine show it. 
that a white robe was put on seems to seems implied by many passages which use the symbolism of donning and doffing clothes in connection with baptism. This is found in Paul, but it was Jewish in origin. The Odes of Solomon often mention it. The Testament of Levi speaks of a clothing, and the pseudo-Clementine writings call baptism call baptism clothing. Um, wait. And the pseudo-Clementine writings call baptism clothing and Duma. Hermes speaks of a white robe in a baptismal context. It would seem that a crown of leaves was also given, as is still the custom in Syria. The practice is mentioned by, Herme, by Hermas, by the Odes, by the Ascension of Isaiah, and by the Testament of Levi. Despite the view of E. Good, good enough, of E. Good enough, it is, it was the, of Jewish origin. It seems linked to the feast of the Tabernaces, of the Tabernacles, and was part of the Mandean ritual of baptism. It is possible that the crown was given only to virgins in the in the celestial liturgy. It was given only to martyrs. The rite of crowning seems to belong chiefly to Eastern Judeo Christianity or to affiliated communities like that of Hermas of Rome. The same is true of another rite, that of drinking baptismal water. Hansens has discovered that a cup of pure water was drunk with the neophytes, characteristic commun a Euchar neophytes Eucharistic communion in the ancient Syrian church. This rite was also part of Mandean baptismal practices, which according to Segelberg, originated at the period we are discussing, and he points out that this rite was purely baptismal. It may be that the numerous allusions in the New Testament and Judeo-Christian literature to a drink of living water are linked to ritual usage, which would seem particularly to be the case in John 4.14 and Odes of Solomon 6.10. Finally, it seems certain that the baptism was followed by a mandication of milk and honey. This is, this is suggested by 1 Peter 2, 2 and the Odes 4, 10. The rite is attested among the Gnostics and among the Marcionites, according to Tertullian. Its Judeo-Christian origin is shown by its presence among the Mandeans, as Segelberg has pointed out. It would seem that the rite immediately followed baptism, coming before the Paschal Catechesis. The whole group of baptismal rites seems to have been followed by a post-baptismal catechesis, which was the starting point for the mystagogical catechesis of the 4th century. As baptism was preferably administered on Easter night, this catechesis took the form of a paschal homily. More exactly, it replaced the Haggadah on the liberation of the Jewish people at the time of the Exodus, which inaugurated the Jewish paschal meat. There, were, there would appear to be a remarkable example of that in 1 Peter, which seems to be a baptismal catechesis and which in its first part compares the liberation of the Christian by baptism to the liberation of Exodus. This is also true of the Paschal homily of Melito of Sardis, which is a little later and which records the events of the departure from Egypt. The homily was followed by a meal, which replaced the Jewish Paschal meal. The Didache gives three prayers of thanksgiving, the first for the wine, the second for the bread, and the third at the end of the meal. All certainly refer to the imitation and make up the sequel to baptism. The Eucharistic overtones of these prayers are unmistakable. Nevertheless, it is possible that they are merely blessings related to the agape that preceded the Eucharist. This meal was probably a relic of the Jewish Paschal meal, reduced to the second cup of wine and the unleavened bread, and preceded and followed by a blessing. In a liturgical fragment by Melito, we probably have the inaugural prayer of the meal that followed the Paschal homily and preceded the Eucharist. The Didache would here exhibit a very archaic state in its juxtaposition of a Paschal rite and the Eucharist. The celebration of the Eucharist ended the vigil. 
we do not possess any information about this celebration at this period apart from that um, apart from that provided by the New Testament. It would seem that it was instituted by Christ during a Paschal meal and so was inspired by the Jewish liturgy of this meal. The consecration of the bread was linked to the blessing of the unleavened bread before the meal. This blessing was a form complete in itself, so it could be separated from the meal. It was the breaking of bread. On the other hand, the consecration of the wine doubtless corresponds to that of the third or of of, of the third of the fourth cup, four cups, that immediately after the meal, before the singing of the Hallel. So the Eucharistic prayer originally seems to have been the revival of these two blessings and have been the for, taken the form of the Jewish Baraka. All the same, it is possible that in the Didache we may have something which belongs to the Eucharistic liturgy in the strict sense, the last of the three acts of thanksgiving. The one with which follows the meal ends with the words, Hosanna to the son of David. If anyone is holy, let him come forward. If he is not, let him be converted. Maranatha. The Hosanna verse is borrowed from Psalm 117.25, which was one of the psalms of the Hallel sung after the meal, before the last cup of wine. Kosmala points out that the object of this last part of the Paschal Haggadah was to ask Yahweh to accomplish in future the same works of liberation that he had accomplished in the past and which were commemorated by the Paschal Haggadah before the meal. But for the Christian, God fulfills this prayer at once by becoming the Eucharist. So the Maranatha may be the initial prayer of the Eucharist in the strict sense. In this respect, it is correct to see it as a, a see in it a trace of the Aramean Eucharist. Its presence at the end of the apocalypse has the same meaning. 2. The Liturgical Calendar Besides the ceremonies of initiation, the best attested Christian institution during this period is the Sunday gathering. The New Testament refers to it several times. The Didache mentions it, gather together on the Lord's Day to break bread and give thanks. So too does the Epistle of Barnabas. Ignatius of Antioch condemns the observance of the Sabbath and champions that of Sunday. Pliny's letter speaks of meeting on a fixed day to sing hymns in turn to Christ before dawn. Ante, um, Antelucanum. We may note that the Didache speaks of a confession before the Sunday Synaxis. This confession was of a liturgical kind. It was collective and was the extension of Jewish practice. There was evidently a normal liturgical penance linked to Sunday assembly, distinct from the reconciliation of sinners, of which Hermas' shepherd speaks and which is, was reserved for exceptional cases. The formula of this penance may have been the last petition of the Sunday prayer. The most complete details of the Sunday assembly are given by Justin and his apology, dating from 140, describes earlier practices. The assembly began with the reading of the memories of the apostles and the writings of the prophets. The first expression seems to indicate that the gospels were made up for, liturgi made up for a liturgical reading. The second seems to refer to the works like the epistles of Paul and Clement and to the prophecies of Hermas. These readings were followed by a homily. Then came prayers for the chief intentions of the church and the kiss of peace. Then the Eucharistic prayer was said, and the people answered, Amen. The deacons distributed the consecrated bread and wine. The alms were collected for the poor. The various names given to, the sun to Sunday provide us with hints as to its origin. The oldest is found in the Didache, Kiriaki. The, fir the word first meant the Christian Easter. In the Apocalypse, when Easter takes place on the 14th Nisan, the word does not perhaps mean Sunday, but that, the, but that is the case everywhere else except in Asia. The Epistle of Barnabas speaks of the eighth day. The expression is found in a Judeo-Christian context where the faithful, after having celebrated the Jewish seventh day, prolonged it until, the, until dawn by their own celebration. It also shows that attention is paid to the peculiarities of the calendar in Jewish and Judeo-Christian circles at this time. 
Finally, Justin speaks of the first day, linking it to the creation of the world. In certain calendars, similar to that of Qumran, the first day of the Feast of Weeks was the Sunday after Easter. It was the day for offering the sheaf of corn or first fruits, a parche, and was linked with the theme of creation. We know the importance of the theme of, of the Aparche in connection with the resurrection of Christ in St. Paul and the designation of Sunday as the first day may belong to this line of thought. Since the resurrection was the first day par excellence, all the Sundays were by extension so called. Apart from Sunday, the Didache shows that Wednesday and Friday were days of Christian fasting, in contrast to the days of Jewish fasting. It is noteworthy that these two days, Wednesday in particular, had a special importance in the calendar of Qumran, and it is possible that we have here a trace of that calendar. Finally, it should be noted that the keeping of the Sabbath as well as the circumcision continued to be observed in many Judeo-Christian communities. This is certainly true of the Ebionites, but also of the Judeo-Christians attached to the great church mentioned by Justin and Epiphanius. Also, Ignatius' polemic against the observance of the Sabbath shows that at Antioch, at the beginning of the second century, certain Christians were continuing to observe it. The question of the attitude of the early Christians is to, to the observance of the feast is more complex. In the first place, it is certain that the Judeo-Christian communities, in the strict sense, continued to observe Jewish feasts. But we know that in Ju Judaism of the period, there was a great diversity of calendars. So the Christian communities re reflected these divergencies. It seems, moreover, that the majority of Christian feasts were transformations of certain Jewish feasts. This was, well, this was so at the beginning of the second century. Was this so at the beginning of the second century? One thing is certain. The celebration of the 14 Nisan, the day of the Jewish Pasch, Pasch by the Christians of Asia. This observance extended to groups in Palestine, Syria, and Rome. Those who kept it were called uh, quarto, decimens, uh, quarto decimens. These were differences among them as to the exact day, like the differences among the Jews. In particular, some of them, following the Essenes, fixed it on the 14th day of the seventh solar month, which still persists among the Montanists. The question was debated at Laodicea about 162. We have evidence that arrival that a rival feast to that of the 14 Nisan was celebrated on the following Sunday. The feast of the Sunday after 14 Nisan is linked to the historical remembrance of the resurrection, just as the 14 Nisan is linked to that of the Passion. But it also coincides, as we have seen, with the first day of the Feast of Weeks. The presence of the theme of the Aparche in St. Paul shows us. Shows this. That day was a Sunday in the nearby priestly circles of Quran, which suggests that the feast first developed in Christian circles stemming from Essenism. A final feature seems to confirm this. We know that in this Essene calendar, on the vigil of the inaugural Sunday of the Feast of Weeks, the crossing of the Red Sea was celebrated. Now that the event remains the essential theme of the Christian Easter vigil, in the Ambrosian Exculpate, for example, it is this group which finally prevailed over that of the Quarto Decimans. Did the Christian liturgical year contain other feasts at the beginning of the second century? The Judeo-Christians continued to celebrate the Jewish feasts, a custom which probably remained. So despite the Alexandrian tendency to interpret Jewish worship in an allegorical sense, certain Jewish feasts reappeared with a Christian meaning. This is true of the celebration of the 50th day of the Feast of Weeks, or of Pentecost, in the 3rd century. The keeping of the 40th day on certain Jewish traditions fixed the ascension of Moses on Sinai. And the Feast of the Tabernacles, which was to reappear in the 4th century under the form of the Feast of the Dedication. It seems clear that Luke connects the outpouring of the Holy Ghost in the 50th day of the weeks, while John connects the nativity of the Feast of the Tabernacles. But that does not permit us to conclude that there was a liturgical celebration of these mysteries in the communities to which they belonged. Perhaps the observance of the 50 days of the Feast of Weeks was kept as a festive usage in communities which celebrated the Feast of First Sunday. 3. The Doctrines 
So far we have studied the basic structure of Judeo-Christianity, now we must look at its more complex characteristics. First, those of relating to knowledge. To this group belongs Christian Gnosis, which derives largely from the, lower, the, from the culture of Low Judaism. On the one hand, it comprises exegesis of various passages of the Old Testament in the manner of the Jewish Targumum. Fragments are extant referring to pr the prophets, especially Jeremiah and Ezekiel. One of its most obvious features is the importance of speculations about the first three chapters of Genesis. An echo of these is to be found in Theophilus of Antioch and in the Elkege Prophetike of Clement of Alexandria, according to Anas um, Anastasius the Sinite, Papias, had interpreted all the Hexameron in terms of Christ and the Church. The Judeo-Christians also took certain Jewish works, in particular some of the Aramean language, and partially rewrote or added to them. That is notably true of the Testaments of the Twelve Patriarchs and the Ascension of Isaiah, parts of which are Jewish and other parts certainly Christian. It is true also of the Prayer of Joseph. Book 5 of the Sibylline Writings also seems to be a Jewish book revised by a Christian. It is possible that the book of the parables in First Enoch, referring to the Son of Man, is Christian. No trace of it has been found at Qumran, although important fragments of other parts have been found. Again, Second Enoch and Fourth Esdras contain parts that are probably Christian. Besides these, the Judeo-Christians wrote the Apocalypses, which were directly inspired by contemporary Jewish apocalyptic ideas. Several take the form of revelations made by the risen Christ to the apostles. For example, the Apocalypse of Peter, the Letter of the Twelve Apostles, the Gospel of Truth, and the Homily of Clement, and the Apocryphon of James. This kind of book was in, the use, in use among the Gnostics. The Apocalypse of John and the Shepherd by Hermas are revelations of the, an apocalyptic nature. Ignatius of Antioch, Papias, and the Gospel of Peter provide us with the fragments of Christian apocalyptic thought. Whatever the literary form in which these works were cast, they all reveal the same intention, namely to establish the fact of revelation itself. The secrets of the heavenly world are unveiled in the strict meaning of the word by the opening of the firmament, which allows the seer to penetrate this upper world and to contemplate what is happening there or to receive a message that explains the realities to him. The, these secrets are the sacred cosmology, the dwellings of God, angels, devils, and the dead, and sacred history, that is to say, the periods fixed eternally by God in the heavenly, heavenly books, which are communicated to the seer. The knowledge of these secrets con constitutes gnosis, datat. Gnosis means, first of all, the apocalyptic knowledge. When the apocalypse blazes with Gnosticism, the false gnosis will be shown in, as, in, as the knowledge of the world pre-existing the aeons. This false gnosis will be a deformation of the apocalyptic gnosis. Let us now single out some of the favorite themes of Judeo-Christian gnosis. First of all, speculations about the Trinity starting from categories borrowed from an um, angelology. The Son, who is usually called the Well-Beloved in the Ascension of Isaiah, is called the Glorious Angel by Hermas. He is the leader of the six arch archangels. This appears already in Ezekiel 9 too. He, was, he is substituted for Michael, as we have seen in Hermas, and as we may conclude from a comparison of um, AP 12.10 uh, and the Essenian Rule of War, the Holy Spirit is presented under the form of Gabriel in um, Isaiah, I think. Again, the two seraphim of Isaiah 6 are represent, a representation of the Son and the Spirit, according to a tradition found in Irenaeus, in which Origen explicitly attributes, uh, and which Origen explicitly attributes to a Judeo-Christian. This notion was, was again put forward in the fourth century by Jerome. The word was designated by a certain number of expressions of Old Testament origin and more closely connected with the speculative interpretations of Judaism. The main ones are the name used specially in the Gospel of Truth, the Law, the Torah as, as Hermas, and the uh, Kirigma of Peter exactly explicitly state. The Alliance, a reference to Isaiah 8.3, as Justin shows, the beginning, according to a Judeo-Christian exegesis of Bereshith, 
or verse 1 of Genesis interpreted as meaning in the first born. This origin is given during our period in the dialogue of Jason and Papiskos, quoted by St. Jerome. The day, as Clement of Alexandria and Justin show, a reference to Genesis 2-4. We may note in this connection the importance of such interpretations of the first part of Genesis. Also, with reference to angelology, the mystery of Christ is presented as a descent of the well-beloved through the seven heavens inhabited by the angels, and then as an ascent through the same heavens. The plan appears in Ephesians 4.9. It is developed in the ascension of Isaiah. We may note that the descent of the well-beloved remains hidden from the angels. This is the notion of the Son putting on the shape of the angels as he reaches each spire. On the other hand, when he, descend, when he ascends in a blaze of glory, the angels adore him. But we also find in Justin the idea that during the ascension, the angels do not recognize the Son because of the human nature he has put on. This second aspect clearly brings out the theological bearing of such a representations. The mystery of the descent is that divinity is humbled to a recognition lower than the angels, that of the ascension is that humanity is called above them. These themes are linked with Psalm 24, as early as, in the, uh, as the Apocalypse of Peter. Another form of expression of the mysteries of Christ in Judeo-Christian theology is the symbolism given the, to the cross. It is considered a living reality, which accompanies Christ in his descent into hell and in the ascension, in the Gospel of Peter and in the Sibylline oracles. It will go before him at the parousia. It is, in fact, the expression of Christ's irresistible power and divine efficiency, uh, efficacy. It is in this sense that we find it prefigured in various passages of the Old Testament, like Moses' prayer, arms held in the shape of a cross, or the horn of the unicorn. One might add Judeo-Christian symbols, mentioned by Justin, like the mast and the plow, which have been found on Judeo-Christian ossuaries. The wood of the cross, united to water, is a sign of the saving power communicated to the baptismal water. Finally, the poor, four points of the cross symbolize the universality of the redemptive action, as Irenaeus shows, referring to the presbyters. Again, among the main themes of Judeo-Christianity, we may note that that of the descent into hell. It seems first and foremost linked to the question of the salvation of the just in the Old Testament, as can be seen in an old Targum by Jeremiah, quoted by Justin. Hermas adds this strange theme of the apostles' descent into hell in order to baptize the dead. More generally, the descent into hell is the expression of Christ's victory over death. This aspect is especially developed in the Odes of Solomon. This descent of Christ to the kingdom of the dead is not the same as his victory over the devil, whose prison is the firmament, according to the ascension of Isaiah, or the air, according to Colossians 2.15. The church's theology includes the use of several symbols originating in contemporary Judaism. That of the plantation stems from the Essenes, that of the ship is found in the ossuaries, an allusion to Noah, and that of, that of the building occurs in Ephesians 8.20. But the most remarkable is that of the pre-existing church. It is found in the shepherd, with the symbol of the woman, who is old because she was created first before all things, with that of the tower built on water, which refers to speculations on the beginning of Genesis, and finally on that of the man and woman, inspired by an apocalyptic exegesis of Genesis 2.24, which is met in Ephesus 5.25-32 and also in Second Clement. A final aspect is concerned with eschatology, the waiting for Christ's return in the establishment of this kingdom on earth. The eschatology has several components, the coming of Christ, which appears in all the authors, the resurrection of the just, or the first resurrection, the transfiguration of the saints still alive, and the messianic reign. This reign, as before, is held to last a thousand years. The expression which occurs in the apocalypse symbolizes paradis paradisal life with man living a thousand years. This symbolism is found in Judaism and is taken over by Judeo-Christians, for example by Papias. This reign 
is interpreted in a very materialistic way by heterodox doctrines like that of Cerinthus, but as an expression of the parousia it is found in many authors, notably in Asia, in John's sphere of influence, and in Philip's. And that ends reading of chapter 6.